It would become known as Black Monday. On the morning of December 10, 1894, two of Newfoundland's three banks closed their doors. They would never open again. The banknotes had been the colony's main form of currency. Now they were practically worthless. The effects were immediate. Businesses shut down, workers became unemployed, families lost their savings, and the Newfoundland government faced imminent bankruptcy. The crisis had taken many people by surprise, but it was a decade in the making, brought on by years of reckless banking amid a weakening economy. Much of the trouble was linked to the salt cod fishery. It was the mainstay of the Newfoundland economy, but it was an industry in decline. By the mid-1880s, competition from French and Norwegian fishers was cutting deeply into Newfoundland's profits. Prices were also low because the market was glutted with cod. Merchant firms in Newfoundland sank into debt. They struggled to keep the cod fishery afloat, but the very way it operated undermined its profitability. That's because it relied on an economic arrangement called the truck system. Each spring, a merchant firm gave its fishers gear, food, clothes, and other supplies on credit. Then, in the fall, the fishers repaid the merchants with cod. But if the crews didn't catch enough cod to pay what they owed, then the merchant carried the debt until a successful fishing season. It was a gamble, and it was one that many merchants were losing in the years leading up to the bank crash. By the late 1880s, merchants like Edwin John Duder were carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars in fishermen debts. It was money that they had little hope of recovering anytime soon. So they turned to the banks for loans. There were three on the island. The oldest was the government-owned Newfoundland Savings Bank, but it was not a commercial institution and did not give out business loans. That left the Union Bank and the Commercial Bank. Both were privately owned and both operated with little government oversight. Year after year, the two banks loaned large sums of money to the already indebted merchants so they could finance a struggling fishery. This was allowed to happen because the same men who borrowed the money also sat on the bank's boards of directors. They were prominent merchants like A. Goodridge, W. B. Grieve, and R. S. Munn. Soon, the banks had given out so many loans that they didn't even have enough money to meet their own business obligations. They began to borrow from British banks. This put the commercial and union banks in a dangerous position. If anything interrupted their ability to get credit from abroad, they would collapse. That collapse was set in motion on December 6, 1894, when a businessman named Henry Hall died. He was the senior partner of a London firm that did business with many Newfoundland fish merchants. After Hall's death, his firm temporarily halted these transactions. This prompted the London banks to suspend credit to the Commercial Bank of Newfoundland. They also asked for repayment on some of their loans. But the Commercial had little money on hand. It called upon the merchants to pay back some of their loans. All they could offer the bank was salt fish. Unable to meet its business obligations, the commercial bank closed on the morning of December 10, 1894. Worried depositors immediately withdrew large sums of money from both the union and savings banks. The savings was in the best position. It had priority on all funds at the union bank and quickly cashed a large check there to meet the demands of its own clients. This allowed the savings bank to stay solvent, but forced the union to close just hours after the commercial. Neither bank opened again. The closures halted business for most merchant firms and left thousands of people unemployed. A Newfoundland journalist named Patrick McGraw described the immediate effects for the National Magazine in Boston. The notes of the two banks represented practically the only circulating medium of the colony. With the exception of a small quantity of fractional currency, the only basis of trade was union and commercial paper. The government, having no official note issue, did all its business and discharged all its obligations with them. It is safe to say that not a family in the whole island was without some of this paper, and now, at one fell stroke, it was rendered worthless. The whole country was panic-stricken. Most businesses stopped accepting union and commercial banknotes immediately, 
This affected almost everyone in Newfoundland. In St. John's, there were hundreds of visitors from across the island who were suddenly stranded because trains and steamers no longer took banknotes. Fish merchants were among the first people to react to the crash. Most depended so heavily on bank loans that they could no longer operate. Some of the largest merchant firms on the island were forced to close. This affected tens of thousands of people from across Newfoundland. Job losses also occurred in other industries. The contractor Robert Reed halted construction of the Newfoundland Railway. 1,200 people were suddenly out of work. Shops on Water Street also suffered because customers couldn't afford groceries, clothes, and other goods. Instead of laying off staff, some businesses chose to employ workers on a part-time basis. The Newfoundland government was in trouble because it had done much of its banking with the union. Of immediate concern was the large public debt. An interest payment was due in London in less than three weeks on New Year's Day. If the government couldn't raise enough money in that time, it would have to default on the loan and declare bankruptcy. Frustratingly, the colony had about $1.6 million worth of salt fish in storage, but after the bank crash, it couldn't even afford to ship that to market. Fortunately, the Union Bank had made a sizable deposit at the National Bank of Commerce in New York before the crash. The government was able to withdraw this money in time for the January deadline and avoid bankruptcy. Officials were also working to reinstate a reliable form of currency in Newfoundland. Five days after the crash, the government appointed a committee to investigate the bank's business affairs. It reported that the Union Bank was in a much better financial situation than the commercial bank. Commissioners recommended that the government guarantee all Union Bank notes for 80% of their value and commercial notes for 20. This came into effect on December 29th when the legislature passed the Bank Note Act. But the move was unpopular with the public. A week later, protesters assembled outside the colonial building with signs demanding bread or labor. When the government didn't respond, they moved on to Water Street and looted stores police eventually dispersed the crowd. But by then, Canadian banks were arriving on the island. The Bank of Nova Scotia opened at St. John's on December 21st. It was followed by the Bank of Montreal, the Canadian Bank of Commerce, and the Merchants Bank of Halifax, which is today known as the Royal Bank of Canada. In January of 1895, the Bank of Montreal accepted the government's account and the Canadian dollar became legal tender in Newfoundland. The arrival of Canadian banks set Newfoundland on a much more sound financial footing, and a successful spring seal hunt further relieved the poverty brought on by the crash. The directors of both the commercial and union banks were charged with fraud and conspiracy. Court action against the commercial directors began in December of 1897. But the impartiality of the proceedings was quickly brought into question. Newfoundland was a small colony. It wasn't just the merchants who were tied to the banks. Many of the colony's judges, lawyers, and politicians were also shareholders. Patrick McGraw reported that the trial was a comic opera. We have judges trying directors of banks to which they were indebted, lawyers prosecuting men who permitted them advances, relatives on the bench, at the bar, on the witness stand, and in the jury box, while every member of the community is directly interested in the scandals being unearthed. As a legal puzzle, the world has never seen anything to equal it. But McGraw also realized that the problem was much more complex than a few corrupt bank directors. In considering the charges against these men, it must be remembered that they are not charged with embezzlement, or willful misappropriation of funds, for which no record is made. Without almost an exception, they stand in the position of men who speculated rashly with the funds entrusted to their charge, in the hope that they would be enabled, after a few good fisheries, to repay all the advances obtained, and who all along acted with the desire of keeping the fisheries going, and thereby promoting the interests of the colony, in which their own were bound up. For this reason, there are many who sympathize with them, arguing that our banking business was conducted on unsound principles. In the end, the prosecution could not prove the charge of conspiracy and the commercial bank directors were acquitted. Charges were also dropped against the directors of the Union Bank, 
By then, many of the merchants connected to the scandal had resumed their involvement in the fish trade. If they had been sentenced to time in jail, then their absence from the industry could have triggered more bankruptcies and once again undermined Newfoundland's still fragile economy. Thank you.